Heroes of the faith, week six. We are in week six. We are flying through this series. I'm enjoying it. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying it. Um, I, I really enjoy working through chapters and books of the Bible. Um, I, I believe that uh, it's important that we do that. Um, I'm not against topical uh, preaching. I think topical preaching is fine. Um, I, what I like, though, about going um, through passages is it forces us to address things that maybe we wouldn't have voluntarily signed up to address. Um, and so we are working our way, specifically through Hebrews chapter 11, through the Hall of Faith, as we look at the heroes of the faith. And here we are in week six. She was beautiful. I couldn't, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. I would have to go online and see her pictures and, and dream of her and I spending time together. For the longest time, she was all I could think about, dreaming that one day she would become mine. I still remember that day, the, the first time that, that I opened her door and now we were face to face and and it was love. We drove everywhere together and shared so many memories. That is until the day I had to put her up for sale. No, I'm not talking about my wife. No, I'm not talking about an ex-girlfriend. Um, I am talking about my beloved 1995 Mitsubishi 3000 GT. I loved that car, man. <laughs> I did. I loved that car. I was obsessed <laughs> with, with that car. <laughs> what about you? What are some things in your life that meant a great deal or still mean a great deal to you? This is where I get to that whole you don't have to raise your hand thing. <laughs> Feel free to interact. And let's just get the whole Jesus part out, right? I know we're at church, and who means the most to you? Jesus. It's just no one I love more than Jesus. Yeah, I know. That's why, that's why you're here on a blistering hot Sunday, right? So I, I got that one out of the way for you, all right? Throw some of the things at me. You don't got to raise your hand, bro. Just My 2008 Shelby GT500 KO. Your 2008 Shelby GT500 KO. Gotcha. <laughs> that was very specific. <laughs> and she's very pretty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh huh. Anyone else? No one else cares about anything or anyone? This is rough, guys. I told you, I spent a lot of time in youth ministry. I need you to talk to me here. What? William, Stephen, and Caitlin. Aw, oh, that's cute. That's good. You were going to say something? Sorry. Your children. Yeah, yeah, your children. Oh, I was just trying to go really specific. My family, my children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, thing, person, noun, right? Person, place, thing, right? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Oh, oh, I could relate. I. My children are things that I'm very happy are upstairs right now. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> what do you guys think? Nothing? Well, man, this is the most content, godly group of people. I, I, I don't belong up here. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> right? I mean, look, I, I, I love my truck. I, I do. Right? Yeah, I'd be willing to get rid of my truck if I had to, but I, I love my truck. I love my camper, you know. I, I like my kids. They're cool. Um, <laughs> your house, right? You, you like your house? Yeah. I, I, your house? Maybe something. What's that thing you had to work really hard for, right? The thing you waited the longest time for and you worked really hard. What? Career. Yeah, your career. That, that counts, right? Your career. Absolutely. Anyone else? Going once, going twice, 
All right. Well, our dear friend Abraham had an obsession as well. He loved his son deeply. Isaac was the son of promise who God had given him at the ripe old age of 100. Isaac, Isaac was the son who was to fulfill the promise God made to Abraham that he would be the father of many, as innumerable as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashores. Now, who's gone to the beach? You live on Long Island, people. Come on. Every hand should have been up, all right? Now, have you ever tried to count the sand? No. Why? Because that's crazy. Because you can't do it. Where do you start? Right? You couldn't count the sand just in a little section, a little sliver of beach. Right? And, and obviously this is alliteration, right? I mean, it's, it's not literally that many people or, or Abraham's children. But God was making the point that he would father many, an innumerable amount. God confirmed it to be true with Abraham that Isaac would be the son of the promise. And yet, we see something Abraham never would have expected to happen. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, Moses writes, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham! Here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said. Your only son, I... Wait, what? Is God bad at math? Because last I checked, Abraham had a son named Ishmael with a woman named Hagar. Is, is God bad at, at math? Or was God illustrating a point? See, here's something I love that, that God does, and I know Stephen's going to kill me, because I always interrupt the Scripture passage, and it drives you nuts. I'm sorry. I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> but, so God has a way of saying things that go right to the heart. Right? Jesus never asked, I'm sorry, Jesus never answered the question that was asked of him. Ever. Read all the Gospels. Jesus always answered the question behind the question. The rich young ruler, what must I do to be saved? What does Jesus tell him? Well, you know, obey, obey all the laws. Well, I've already done that. Oh, you have? Good. Okay. Sell all your things and give them to the poor. Now, can I just be really clear? It's my job to equip you to do the work of the ministry. So if you were to say to me, hey, Pastor Vinny, please equip me to go share the gospel and do street ministry. Okay? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to approach people and ask them questions and I'm going to try to lead them to Jesus. Amen. God bless you. All right, Vinny, what do, what do I say to somebody if they ask me how to become a Christian, how to get saved? I will not give you the answer Jesus gave this guy. Guys, Jesus got the gospel wrong. Jesus said, go sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. Anybody else find that interesting? Anybody. Anybody else find that interesting? You see, we, we, we just go over these passages quickly without considering something. Hey, Jesus didn't get the gospel wrong. Jesus answered the question behind the question. Jesus didn't give him the textbook answer, what must you do to be saved? Well, accept me into your heart, repent, be baptized, follow me. Right? No, no, no. No, no, no. Jesus, Jesus said to him, you know what? Something has you. And until you get rid of that thing, until you repent of that thing that has you, and you give me first place, salvation, you're not going to receive it, you're not going to understand it, you're not going to get it. Who can serve two masters? No one. See, Jesus always answered the question behind the question. Jesus didn't get the gospel wrong, my friends. Obviously. <laughs> right? Do you get the point? So when, when God says to Abraham, take your son, your only 
son. That was God speaking directly to Abraham's heart. That, that wasn't God putting something in there to make skeptical people who read the Bible thousands of years later go, oh, God got it wrong. No, no, God doesn't care about the critics, right? God is confident. God doesn't, doesn't have to be defensive and, and prepare the scriptures in such a way that, that he answers every skeptic. No, no, it doesn't matter. Because you know what? Every skeptic that actually sought after God eventually bowed their knees to him. But he's getting to Abraham's heart. Abraham, the son who you love. Ever since you had this kid, you've been ignoring Ishmael, haven't you? Right? <laughs> this one's your favorite, isn't he? Why? Because you still see Ishmael as a mistake you made rather than, rather than a, a, a man who is your son. But you know what, Abraham? I'm going to bless him too. I'm going to bless him too because I promised you long ago that everyone who blesses you, I'll bless, and everyone who curses you, I'll curse, and I still keep my promises even when you make mistakes. But Abraham, we're not talking about Ishmael today, Abraham. Today, I'm going right after your heart. Today, I want you to take your son. You can put it back on the screen, sorry. Your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Well, this is interesting. I mean, what was Abraham thinking here? Consider, consider this. Had Abraham considered that, that perhaps he misunderstood or misheard? I mean, I don't know what emotions Abraham was dealing with, but we've seen Abraham converse with God before, right? We've seen that. We've been going through that, right? We've, we've looked at previous experiences where, where God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham was like, well, God, what about this? Or, or God, I, I didn't really expect that. Or, 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 you know, what we didn't go over together, but what's in there, and I would encourage you to go read this portion of Genesis, these few chapters, is, is at one point God's talking to Abraham about destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? And Abraham is having this conversation with God. God, please, what if, what if you just find this many faithful? What about this many? What about, right? And, and you, see, you see interaction. This isn't Abraham's first conversation with God. But what's interesting is this is the first conversation that ends differently. This is the first conversation where Abraham didn't question, didn't push back, didn't continue the conversation. We see no audible reply here from Abraham at all. In fact, the response that we see in the very next verse is this. Genesis 22, 3 through 6. It says, So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship, and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Did you catch that? Do, do, do you see what I see there? Right? That's crazy. But aren't you so proud of Abraham right now? This, 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 this isn't the Abraham. Check this out. <laughs> Abraham, we saw only a few chapters ago, ran into Egypt out of fear. Remember that, Abraham? Do you, do, you remember, do you remember the Abraham that, that didn't lead his family but took his wife's horrible suggestion to go and, and, and have a child with Hagar? You guys remember that, Abraham? You do, right? Okay, so, so I, believe, I believe Abraham showed us something here in this passage very, very valuable that we all need to learn. You ready? 
Learn from mistakes. Whether they are yours or someone else's. Learn from mistakes. You don't have to raise your hand. Amen. That's right. And, and I'll tell you what, I feel the same way. But you know what? And, and, and here's what's powerful about that. You know what? You and I, we, we stand here today and, and say, man, there's no way I could, I could sacrifice my own son. That's not the first thing God asked Abraham to do. See, God gave Abraham little, and Abraham wrestled and struggled, and Abraham made mistakes, and God redirected and, and confirmed his blessing and his promise. And then God trusted Abraham with a little more, and Abraham messed up again, and God lovingly corrected him and redirected him and showed him, my promise still stands true, my, my dear son. My love for you hasn't changed. My promises for you haven't changed. Are you going to learn to trust me so you don't have to go through these detour heartbreaks any, anymore? See, he didn't open with, take your son, your only son whom you love. He opened up with these other trials, this other testing. Have you noticed the trials and the testing in your life doesn't get easier, it gets harder? H have you noticed that he's always stretching you more? See, what you don't realize, or maybe you do, is the trial you're dealing with now, although it's pulling you out of your comfort zone and making it more difficult for you, if you, right now, where you're currently at, went back to deal with your old trials, you'd fly through those things, man. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Fresh lemonade on a hot day, right? That's, that's exactly, it would be easy now. Like the gym rat who started off only bench pressing 50 and now bench presses 350, but he's really trying to get to 400. But the rest of us look at him like, dude. And he's like, oh no, man, I got so much longer to go. And we're all like, you don't have a neck, right? <laughs> you know, but he's disappointed that his muscles aren't bigger, that he can't lift more. Why? Because God is stretching you. He's stretching your faith. And he gives you the grace to go through whatever he's testing you with. Always. But Abraham learned something powerful. Abraham learned from his mistakes. He learned that you could trust God even when it goes against your thoughts or your feelings. Abraham's faith had been worked out. It, it had been built up. It had become so strengthened that he had become this hero of the faith who would hear God tell him to sacrifice his son, who he loved more than anything, who he waited a hundred years for, who, who would be the heir to all of his possessions and God's promises to him, and the very next morning would get up early to obey. He did not delay. He did not gripe. He immediately obeyed. Yeah, please. Yeah, you know, that's, that's interesting. Is it depends who you ask, right? So, um, and, and for anybody that didn't hear you say that, so uh, Nick asked, um, how old do I think Isaac was? Um, I, I don't know. Some, some believe he was just a young boy. Um, some believe that he was just um, not married yet, but was maybe in his 20s or 30s even. Um, I, I don't know. I, I won't speak confidently to either because neither of the theologians who've commented on that were there. <laughs> um, here's what we do know. We know he wasn't a baby because he had the responsibilities of carrying things up for the sacrifice. We know that this wasn't the first sacrifice him and his father did together because in the conversation, he's like, yo, dad, we're missing something. Um, and, and, you know, who lets their toddler walk up a mountain? Uh, <laughs> you know? So if it's said that Abraham carried Isaac up, then I would say he was probably a baby or a toddler. But we know he was at least at, at an old enough age to have a conversation with his dad, to understand what's going on, to have been involved in the sacrifice before, which is the reason why some believe that he was probably 12 or 13, because typically in the Hebrew culture, as a rite of passage, when he hit those teenage years, is usually when you started to bring your son with you to go do the sacrificing. So that's, that's the reason why some would say that. But he could have been 12 or 13. He could have been 25, 30. Who, who knows? Either way, he was a submissive, obedient son 
who Abraham was head over heels in love with. So, yeah. So, but did, did, did you see what else he said here that was, that was interesting in this passage? When Abraham gets to the base of the mountain before climbing up, and he says to the servants, we're going to go worship. We will be right back. Interesting. You want to talk about faith. You want to talk about confidence, right? And, and if I just, if I may, for, for a moment, um, the word confidence means with faith. Confide. Confidence. With faith. Okay? He had confidence that God would keep His promises no matter what. How do we know this? Because the writer of Hebrews tells us this in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, where it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, Your offspring will be called through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. This is crazy. It, it, it's interesting to me that the disciples who walked with Jesus, who Jesus plainly said to them, I'm going to die, but I'll be back. Three days. Put it on your calendars, boys. I'll be back freaked out when he was crucified like oh no he's gone and then when they go to the empty tomb angel's like he kind of called this where were you that day (laughs) right and yet and yet we see abraham who had never witnessed the dead being raised let's do a quick comparison for you right The disciples literally saw Jesus raise the dead. They didn't just believe the dead could be raised. They witnessed it. Abraham never witnessed the resurrection and was so confident that if God would have him sacrifice his own son, even if he sacrifices his own son as a burnt Offering, listen, as a burnt offering. Did you hear that? As a burnt offering. You might be okay after a stab wound. But if you're nothing but ashes, you didn't survive that. He believed God had the ability to keep His promises even when the son of the promise is nothing but ashes. Abraham understood something powerful with his obedience. He recognized every gift from God is not ours to keep, but ours to manage. Everything. Every single gift given to us from God is not ours to keep. It is ours to manage, even in eternity. When you get to heaven and you're given crowns, and gifts. You're managing them very briefly because you are then placing them at His feet. Every single thing you have, naked you came into the world, naked you will leave. Job got it. Abraham got it. The wealth you've acquired will belong to someone else. Your clothes will be eaten by moth. Your food will spoil. Your legacy will be forgotten. Except by the one who actually matters. Abraham recognized every gift from God is not ours to keep, but ours to manage. This goes for our relationships. This goes for our finances. This goes for our time. We will give an account to God for how we manage the resources He has given us to manage for Him. Every single one of them. I mean, this is the reason that Dave Ramsey is so successful in the church world, because he takes biblical principles and he gets people to understand. I, I love something that he says. 
I love when, when he says, if you managed the wealth for you incorporated, would you fire you? If you managed the wealth for you incorporated, would you fire you? If you spend more than what comes in, if somebody who works for you in your company that you're managing and you hire them to do the books and they let more go out than comes in, wouldn't you fire that person? Right. So Dave Ramsey says, would, would, would you fire you <laughs> the way you run you incorporated? Because here's the deal. I don't own anything. The money that slips through my fingers is a tool given to me by God and he lets me hold on to a bunch of it to take care of my own stuff and my own needs, but he expects me to be generous with it. He expects me to bless others with it. He expects the money that comes through my fingers to be pushing the gospel forward. If it's not, I'm wasting his resources and I will give an account for that. Are we willing to give up what we love the most and give those things back to him? If we are not, then we have believed the lie that we are owners instead of managers of the resources that God has blessed us with. Abraham believed that Isaac belonged to God and not himself. Abraham believed that Isaac belonged to God and not himself. Listen, I don't discipline my kids because it's convenient for me. I discipline my kids because that's the first line of discipleship I'm responsible for. Those little guys and that little girl do not belong to me. They belong to God. And he has given me the responsibility and the joy, but the responsibility of turning them into devil-stomping, gospel-preaching, Jesus-loving, enemy-not-fearing disciples of Jesus Christ set out on mission. In Proverbs, it says, children are arrows in your quiver. An arrow that stays in your quiver did not accomplish its purpose. But the arrow must be launched forward, outside of my control, outside of my jurisdiction, because they don't actually belong to me. It's my responsibility to equip them, to train them, to set them free, to go do the work of the ministry. So when I look at my kids, I don't see kids. I see pre-adults. I see warriors in training. And that's how we have to raise our children because at the end of the day, I don't get to raise them however I want. I have to raise them according to his word because they're his kids, not mine. Abraham believed Isaac belonged to God, not himself, and God keeps his promises no matter what. Could you imagine what it would look like if we lived with that kind of faith? Well, that is exactly what God is producing in your life. He's stretching your faith even now while you struggle and while you wrestle to trust Him for the things that you need right now. Right now. You have struggles and issues and He is stretching your faith in Him so one day your faith looks like Abraham's faith in this situation. He's working that faith muscle in you so it becomes easier to do the heavy lifting. Abraham went through years of training and faith stretching and growing and being challenged and yet reassured, right? God is such a loving father where we, we mess up big time and instead of him just crushing us and saying, I quit, I'm done with you. Instead, he says, hey, that was stupid, right? Yeah, dad, that was stupid. All right, just to be clear, <laughs> just to be clear, that happened because you didn't listen to me did you learn? Oh, I learned. Good, because my promises haven't changed. I'm still holding on to you, and we're still going in the same direction together. God asked Abraham to bring that which he loved the most to the altar, to display that he loved God more than his own son. What do you need to lay at the altar this morning? What do you need to lay at the altar this morning? I am not suggesting that you proactively throw away things and relationships you value just to make a statement, God, I love you. Abraham didn't just flippantly go and sacrifice Isaac to prove he loved God more than Isaac, but he was willing when God asked that of him. 
Or as, as I've said many times before, what in your life is not for sale? What in your life is not for sale? You see, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field that a man stumbles upon. And when he stumbles upon it, he goes home and he puts up everything that he had for sale so that he can go and purchase that field. You know that parable? You remember that parable? That's from Jesus. And so I ask you the question, in recognizing that the kingdom of heaven is like a field that in it is a great treasure, what is it that you currently possess, at least you think you possess, that is not for sale? What area of your life are you like, God, you could change this and you could change this and God, I'll do this for you. Yeah, that's the game changer right there. You can't go there. What's that thing? What's the thing? We all have one. Abraham did. Abraham had one. It was his son. That was the thing. And in that moment of testing, Abraham proved that not even that thing will get in the way. What's the thing? What's the hardest thing in your life to let go of? I think there's one that we all have in common as Americans. It's comfort. I know if the AC did not work in here today, this, this would be a, a, a pretty good object lesson. <laughs> right? We, we love our comforts. We love our comforts. We hate pain. Oh, pain's the enemy. But God uses pain to build character in us. It's in, those, it's, it's in the dark night of the soul. It's in turmoil. It's in pain that we grow, that we develop. But the second we feel the slightest bit of pain, we've got to get the Tylenol and, and we've got to get the, the aspirin and, and, and we, we need all, everything we can to get rid of the pain. Emotional pain, God forbid we push through any emotional pain. We have to immediately get it resolved. Go distract ourselves. Do something else. Run away. Go become a shopaholic, an alcoholic, a portaholic. Pick something, right? Just to get away from the pain, we go and get distracted by other things. Because we hate the pain. We don't even like those other things that much. But, but it's something that we could feel some sort of semblance again, right? We hate pain. If it's God's will for you to go through some suffering, but it's going to strengthen you, it's going to stretch your faith, and God's going to be glorified more in it. Are you willing to go through it? Are you? You know what? Job, Job kind of didn't get to vote on that. <laughs> right? Job kind of got that thrust upon him. And in the end, it worked out better for Job than if it never happened. You should consider what you might not be willing to give up if God asked you to sacrifice that thing. This is how we find out what things or people have become idols in our lives. So Abraham and his young son Isaac would travel up the mountain with fire and wood, but no animal to sacrifice. And this, this piqued Isaac's curiosity. And so he asks his dad, where's the sacrifice? Abraham tells his son, God himself will provide the lamb. They have this conversation. You ready? This is, this is crazy. Don't miss this. And this is, I, I love how the Old Testament and the New Testament are interwoven so beautifully. They're climbing up the mountain, Mount Moriah. Now remember, this is not settled land yet. This is their intent. They, they don't have homes. God said, go to Abraham. And he promised him this land to future generations. And he even told Abraham that there would be 400 years of slavery that his people would go through before they would be set free and they would inhabit the land. God already told Abraham all of this. And they're living in tents as nomads. And they're climbing up this mountain. 
And him and his son, while they're climbing up this mountain and have this conversation, they're having this conversation on the very mountain where, where over 400 years later, the temple would be built on that very site with a small hill only a few hundred yards away that looked just like a skull that they could see from right there. You know what that hill that looks like a skull would be called a couple of thousand years later? Calvary. Golgotha. The place of the skull. Just outside of Jerusalem where it would be built on that spot. So as Abraham is walking up the mountain with his son, with his arm around him, he says God's going to provide for himself a lamb. You see that hill right there? The Lamb of God, who once and for all takes away the sin of the world, would be crucified on the very hill that was in sight as he's having this conversation with his son thousands of years before Jesus was even born in Bethlehem. Genesis chapter 22, verses 9 through 13 concludes their journey. It says, when they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out, took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. God stopped him from sacrificing his only son only a few yards away from the place where God would not stop himself from sacrificing his only son. God tested Abraham's faith and Abraham passed the test. Now, let me just be really clear here. Um, God did not learn anything new that day. (laughs) God is omniscient and immutable. These are fancy ways of saying God knows everything and never changes. God does not make decisions based on new information or, and hear me out now, God does not base decisions even on foreknowledge. He has foreknowledge, but he does not look down the annals of time and base his decisions off of how other people will respond in the future. Rather, he holds the future. God tested Abraham for Abraham's sake and for our sakes today. God tested Abraham for Abraham's sake and for our sakes today. The Bible was not written to us, but it was written for us to learn and apply that which we should apply. We should desire and strive to have the same faith that Abraham displayed here. But keep this in mind. God is not task-oriented. God is relationship-oriented. God is not task-oriented. God is relationship-oriented. God did not test Abraham's faith as a tease or like a cruel taskmaster. But it's more important that Abraham trusts God completely and loves God completely more than anything or anyone else. And it was through this testing that Abraham's faith and love for God were strengthened. I've done this to my own children. Not to be cruel, but my daughter Isabella was born an independent woman. She was born that way, man. You want to you wanna hold her? No, nope. from the tiniest age, she wanted to get up and go. Then she starts walking. We go to the store. 
She does not care where we are. Just <whistles> So one time, while we were in the store shopping, I stayed at a distance but watched her just to see at what point is this chick going to turn around and wonder where I am. And she didn't. She just <whistles> kept going. I tested her. I waited, 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 waited for her to finally look around and freak out. Before I went over, picked her up, gave her a big hug and kiss and said, you do not walk away from mommy and daddy because somebody else could have grabbed you and done horrible things to you. You need to stay near mommy and daddy. Now, she's an extrovert. Like, she'll still just completely go up to strangers and think everybody just has the best intentions and, you know, hey, kid, I got a white van with blacked out windows and candy in there. You want to come visit? Sure, do you have puppies too? Like, that, right? that's, that, that's who she is, and God bless her. In, in many ways, that's a good thing. It's, it's, it's a pure heart, and to those who are pure, all things are pure, but the world is not pure. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, that's who she is. But I've had to test her so that I can train her so that she can learn. It wasn't for me to learn. It was for her to learn, to understand boundaries, to understand herself, to recognize her own habits and her own natural proclivities, right? If you feel like God is stretching you and, and you feel alone or like he's abandoned you or like you've made too many mistakes or gotten too far off track, well, I'll tell you right now, that is blatantly a lie. God is committed to you and will stretch you and strengthen you. Because the point of the trial or the test is not just to teach you valuable lessons. Listen, you ready? The purpose of the test and the trial and the stretching is not only to teach you valuable lessons. It's not only just to stretch your faith. It's also to strengthen your love and your trust in Him. Your love. It deepens. You, you, you begin to understand the why on a deeper level, which is even more important than the what. God will never let me down. Amen. God's promises are true. Amen. That's great. That just means God is faithful. But now let's get to why he's faithful. He's faithful because he's head over heels in love with me. And he knows what's best for me. So if I could, if I could put that into the equation, then it's not just I trust you. It's I'm ooey gooey around you. It's, oh man, you care that much for me? Man, everybody else who's cared for me, there's been strings attached but not you. You don't need me. You don't need me at all. In fact, if, I, if I'm really honest, I, I kind of delay the whole process. I kind of am more in the way than helpful. And yet, you love me so deeply. It's compelling. And what's cool is the natural consequence of loving him more deeply is hating sin more deeply. Now, it doesn't mean you'll be perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to. It just means you hate it. And you tend to try to stay away from the things you hate. It's kind of a natural thing. Right? And look, man, I'm, I believe the church needs to be a place where we talk about sin and where we address sin. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not going to shy away from sin. We live in a world where people are afraid to call sin what it is. I'm going to call it what it is. But what I am going to tell you is this. The answer to the sin, the answer to how we fix this, is not the answer that so much of the church has been portraying. Try harder. Don't do that. Don't break the rules. You'll get in trouble. Right? Right? The shirt's too low. The skirt's too high. Only focusing on outer appearance, right? Don't touch that. Don't eat that. Don't do that. Don't smoke that. Leave him alone. Leave her alone. Stop lying. Stop gossiping. Stop this. It's just like, 
Well, what the heck, man? That doesn't help anybody. So what's the answer? Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. A man who is head over heels in love with one woman is not somebody who I have to convince to stop going after other women. I don't have to have a sit down, come to Jesus conversation with him. It's pretty simple. He's so in love with that woman that he just naturally... (laughs) Allow the Holy Spirit to convict you, but not in a way where you beat yourself up and you feel angry and frustrated. Be angry with sin. Hate sin. Hate that it gets in the way of this love relationship you have with God. But love Him more deeply. Be stretched further. Love Him wholly. And what will happen is naturally, without you forcing it, naturally you will sin less. Naturally. But the answer is love Him more deeply. Trust Him more truly. Not enforce the rules. Does that make sense? I got one amen. Yeah. But does, does does that make sense? The beauty of that is when the church lives that out, something amazing happens. You know what happens? Tax collectors and prostitutes feel really comfortable around us. And religious people judge the crap out of us. Isn't that awesome? Man, I I can't wait for that. I can't wait for the religious people to be like, dude, do you know who's like coming to your church and who you're associating with? Yeah, you're you're welcome too, man. You're kind of worse than them, you judgy Pharisee. (laughs) <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, you, you, I got to tell you, God is so good that this loser gets to preach. You, come on. And that's, man, you, you, you just love him more deeply. And you will attract people who are so desperate for that love. So desperate for that love. God provided a ram for Abraham to sacrifice in place of Isaac. And so God would also send his son in our place to be sacrificed on the cross because God keeps his promises. God reaffirmed his promise to Abraham and Abraham spent the rest of his life raising his son and preparing him for the legacy that God had promised through him. But that legacy and that conversation is to be continued next week. In the interim, seek God. Ask Him what it is He's trying to teach you. And ask Him to reveal what thing it is that might be getting in the way of that deeper trust and that deeper love. I delayed, I delayed walking away from a stable assistant pastor position to plant this church. I delayed that because of fear. I delayed that because of fear. Because I didn't, I didn't trust God to provide for me to go into the unknown. And when I finally did, what happened is God provided a job for me that made actually more money now than what I was making without me even filling out a resume. If stupid me (laughs) would have just been like, okay, Lord. Okay. Learn from my mistake. Don't make the same one. Hey, you, you, you may be in an extreme position where, where following God means a career change. 
he'll provide. And, and whatever you can't afford in his provision is probably something you actually don't need. He's good. But he's not just good in general. He's good to you. He loves you deeply, personally. Not only as a group, right? I know, lumped together, we are the church, right? We're one. I, I get it. We're the bride of Christ. I, I get that. But it's, it's not only as a group that he loves us. It's individually. And I just want to encourage you with this. Take advantage of the fact that the Holy of Holies is, is open to you. Take advantage of the fact that when Christ died on the cross, God himself tore the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from us, himself, from top to bottom, tore it. And exposed the Holy of Holies. And that wasn't the presence of God getting out. That was an invitation to come in. It was an invitation. We have been invited by God into His presence. And, and it's not that you no longer need a high priest. It's not that you no longer need one. You just now have one in Jesus who sits at the right hand of the Father who never has to make sacrifice for His own sin because He was sinless and once and for all made the ultimate sacrifice so that we can have fellowship with God. Which means, my dear friends, Prayer needs to be foundational to your life. You no longer need to go to a man to go to God. But the God-man is open 24-7 and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And we'll go, we'll go into this. I, I'm not going to spend too much time here. We will one day go into the details of the role that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit play in your life. Because they actually, the three of them in one actually play significantly different roles in your life. In salvation, in communication, in, in all of that stuff. And we'll, we'll go into that. We'll go into that. But, but just, just understand, you have an advantage. You can walk boldly before his throne. And, and, and when Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, and he opened up with, our Father. That was radical. That was radical. That's right. The, 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 the um, uh, children of Israel, there was such a reverence and a holiness factor and an otherness of who God was. That Check this out. When the scribes, when, when the scribes would take Moses' writings and would transcribe them onto a new scroll, Every time the name for God was written there, every time that they would transcribe it, they would first go, take a bath, do a whole cleansing ceremony, come back, write it down, go back, do it again, come back, and continue writing. Just because they were transcribing his name. So, when Jesus says, say, our Father... That's shock value. That would be like me cursing in the middle of a sermon for how you'd be like, what? <laughs> right? It, Jesus says, yeah, our Father. What? Whoa, whoa. That's Elohim. That is Yahweh. What do you mean, our Father? And then as the disciples listen in to Jesus praying and hear him go, Abba, Papa, Daddy. That is powerful. May we not minimize what was done to bring us to the place where we can say, Abba, Daddy, it's your kid again. May we not be too busy 
to barge into his throne room and just worship at his feet. Don't be afraid of your, your, your faith being stretched. It hurts, but he's glorified and he's turning you into warriors. And it's warriors who go and take territory from the enemy. And as we've said from day one, Park Center, we're not looking to entertain Christians and move sheep from one pasture to another. We're looking to reach lost, broken people. And the lost, broken people, hey, you know what? They're your neighbors. They're your friends. They're your family members. A lost, broken person could be a a, a millionaire, right? It's not only the financially poor. Love people. Share the gospel. And then live out what you share. That's how we change the world. And Jesus didn't tell us he was coming back and taking us with him so we could just think about evacuation all day every day. He told us that because he wants us to have that hope. But he told us to go into all the world. And there's, there's this pastor I, I, I watch from uh, uh, Apologia Studios. His name is Jeff Durbin. Um, he's out of Arizona. Great guy. If you're bored and you go on YouTube, look up Jeff Durbin. He's awesome. And um, he brought up this, this great point that was really like, I, I loved it. He, um, he goes, you know, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Now, we've, we've all heard that passage, right? Okay, so, so can I ask you guys a question? Has anyone here ever been attacked by a gate? Mm? You know what a gate is used for? Defense. And as Christians, we have this passive mentality. <laughs> that I believe. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate that. Attacked by Bill Gates. Yes. But but gates gates are for defense. Gates are for defense, which means us sitting around and defending ourselves against the enemy with the sword of the spirit, which Pastor Paul is going to be doing a series on spiritual warfare pretty soon. Get excited. Um that you excited? All right. Whatever. So, <laughs> but, but while, while, while we are standing back here with the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, and we've got this picture like, you know, a knight defending himself against all these things around him, it's the wrong picture. We are on the offensive. We are not to wait for the enemy to strike so we could defend ourselves. But the church is to expand the kingdom. The gates of hell will not prevail means it's our job to storm the gates. We need to stop playing defense. We need to get aggressive. We need to go. This is why I believe in church planting. I've said it from day one. Our mission is to multiply Christ followers and plant Christ following churches. Because, and studies have shown this, The single greatest tool of evangelism that we see today is church planting, is small little bodies being sent out into enemy territory and infiltrating in the workplace. In the workplace, you are at your job not for money. You're at your job because there's people that don't know Jesus that are forced to be around you for eight hours a day. Live the gospel. Go take territory from the enemy. It's, you're not like a super Christian if you do that. That's like standard. We are Christians. We are missionaries or imposters. We have to get on the offensive. You with me? Because my goal is not just to hype you up. My goal is to equip you and set you free. Listen, we believe in low control, high accountability. Low control, high accountability. Ask Nick this morning. I'm far from a control freak. I'm, I'm really, because I believe, I believe it's my job to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I believe too many churches have this model that say, all your job is, is to get your friends to come visit the church and come let professional pastor be the one that leads them to the Lord. No, that's the very opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. It's my job to equip you. 
It's your job to go change the world. That is your calling. So let's do it. And the only way that we will do that is if our faith is stretched. Abraham believed God could raise the dead even if he burnt him to ashes. Well, you know what? God's calling you to go and talk to people who are spiritually dead. Do you believe that the spiritually dead, that God could raise them to life? If you believe that, let's live that way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. God, we are compelled by you. God, we are honored that you would use us to do your will. Father, I pray that you stretch our faith. I pray that you get us out of our comfort zones. God, I pray that you shake us up. You make us more like you. You make us love you more deeply and more truly. God, that you forgive us for getting off mission and detouring. God, that you would put your finger on the things in our lives that need to change. But God, as we look at those things that that we wouldn't try to fix them by putting in systems and rules, but that we would weigh those things in comparison to you and would fall more deeply in love with you over those things. Father, I pray that you would reveal in our hearts the thing that's not yet for sale and that we would put it for sale for you. God, that we would protect our time, our energy, our efforts, that we would live strategically, that we would rest strategically, that we would use wisdom in our interactions, on our job, in our families, wherever we go, God, that we would lead others to know and to love you and that we would see dead souls raised. For your honor and your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen.